Hello, my name is Karen Allen and welcome to Adventures in Dolls, UFDC's YouTube channel. Today our program is bringing Louisa May Alcott's uh, Little Women to life. It's written by Linda Edwards and it's um, it features an in-depth look at Louisa May Alcott's life uh, and how the story of Little was portrayed uh, through dolls. So, before we get to the program, I'd like to remind you to leave us uh, comments in the comment section below. We'd love to hear from you. Um, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button uh, and the subscribe button. Remember, uh, if you subscribe, there's no fee involved. Simply it boosts our rating with YouTube. So please like and subscribe so you don't miss your next adventure in dolls. So enjoy the program. Little did Louisa May Alcott know when she wrote Little Women that it would become a treasured piece of juvenile literature and inspire so many doll makers to create dolls in likenesses of the story's characters. This is the story behind the story of this classic tale and the dolls it inspired. The novel Little Women began as a strictly commercial enterprise. In 1867, Thomas Niles, who was Louisa May Alcott's editor at Roberts Brothers Publishers in Boston, asked her to write a book about girls, something that would have a wide appeal. Alcott herself was not particularly excited about the concept. She wished to publish a collection of short stories at the time. But through the urging of her publishers and her father, she set out to write the story of four adolescent girls and their journey to adulthood. She went to work on the project, but was far from convinced of its success, stating, Never liked girls, or knew many, except my sisters. But our queer plays and experiences may prove interesting, though I doubt it. During the post-Civil War era, the accepted future role for all girls was that of wife and mother. Children's literature of the time reflected this. Girls that appeared in stories were usually longing for romance culminating in marriage, or marginalized characters concerned only with frivolity or domestic affairs. Alcott's protagonist and her siblings were steeped in this existing culture, but were also filled with hopes and dreams that supported their desires to lead useful lives while nurturing and expressing their individuality. The original printing of this tale was comprised of only half the story we now think of as Little Women. Louisa wrote the story quickly, and it was published in 1868. The original volume concluded with John's proposal to Meg. The book sold incredibly well. Volume 1 sold 6,500 copies in the first months of its release. Alcott soon found herself flooded with letters from readers wanting to know what happened to the girls later. Three months after its first publication, Alcott completed the second part of the story and sent it to her publishers. It was released in 1869 as a companion book to Part 1. It sold more than 13,000 copies within weeks of its debut. Later printings in the USA would combine the two volumes into one. The addition of Little Women Part 2 increased the sales of Part 1, and the book entered the realm of beloved stories in fact creating a new genre within girls fiction the book became tremendously popular in the usa britain and eventually all over the world little women is most often classified today as being semi-autobiographical louisa may alcott was born in germantown pennsylvania on november 29 1832 she had one older sister anna
two younger sisters, Elizabeth and May. Her father, Bronson Alcott, was a well-known philosopher, a leader in the newly emerging transcendental movement in America, and a proponent of educational reform. He provided much of the education his daughters received and encouraged them to write about their personal thoughts and experiences. Louise's mother, Abigail Alcott, was steeped in Christian principles which she endeavored to instill in her children through her example of working for many charitable causes. The Alcotts moved house multiple times in Louise's early life, most often living in and around the Boston and Concord, Massachusetts areas. Her family traveled in the same social circles as Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, whose influences can be seen in the lives of the fictional March girls in their love of nature and their ability to think things out for themselves. Many of the Alcott's acquaintances included the intellectual and literary community of their day. The Alcott's did not have an easy life. Their father's philosophical views did little to earn the income needed to provide for the physical needs of their family. In fact, he eventually decided that it would be morally wrong for him to work for money. As a result, the family lived in a perpetual state of poverty, often acquiring and ignoring financial debts they incurred and subsisting on the charity of friends and relations, much to the embarrassment of the girls. Emerson and Thoreau each contributed often to the family's sinking fund. This led Louisa to develop a great determination to provide income for herself and her family as well as underscoring a high regard for the importance of charity to one's neighbors. At age 15, she wrote in her journal, I will do something by and by, don't care what, teach, sew, act, write, anything to help the family, and I'll be rich and famous and happy before I die, see if I won't. This young zeal turned to action, and she did indeed begin working trying her hand at teaching, sewing, child care, and domestic service. In other words, any of the occupations generally open to women during the period. She soon found that she didn't enjoy any of these jobs. She also appeared as an actor in many charity performances and often dreamed of a career on the stage. She had always thought of herself as a writer. Her earliest public venues for her work were in the plays that she and her sisters acted out for friends. Being a tomboy herself, it had been reported that she preferred to play some of the more lurid parts in these plays, the villains, ghosts, bandits, and disdainful queens. She began her career as a paid writer with a poem called Sunlight, which appeared in Peterson's magazine in 1852. Alcott used the pseudonym Flora Fairfield for this work. It would be the first of many a nom de plume she would adopt through the years. In 1852, her first book, entitled Flower Fables, was published. This was a collection of short stories she had made up for a young relative during a period when she worked as a governess for the child. During the Civil War, Louisa signed up to be a Union Army nurse. She longed to be involved in the thrill and adventure of war. Her eyes were quickly open to the realities of desperately wounded soldiers. The experience initiated tremendous personal growth for her and resulted in the publishing of a book of her collected letters home during the period. Hospital Sketches was one of the first accounts of the unvarnished experiences of soldiers that were fighting in that conflict. Her work as a nurse took an almost deadly toll on her health. She contracted typhoid pneumonia and was eventually sent home for a prolonged recovery period. Louisa would go on to have eight major works published before writing Little Women, and did indeed reach her goal of bringing her family up out of poverty. By her mid-thirties, Louisa had trained herself to be a successful working writer, a task that few of her contemporaries, female or male, were able to accomplish. She was eventually able to purchase her family a home in Concord, which they called Orchard House. 
and Louisa took up residence there with her parents. Louisa would have an active career, writing both works for children and more racy adventures and mystery stories for an adult audience, which were usually published under her various pseudonyms. Not only was she prolific in her work, but she also showed a very canny business sense when she retained the copyrights to Little Women and other works, a practice that most authors had not yet adopted at the time. The royalties from her works sustained she and her family through the latter years when she was ill and unable to work. Louisa died at age 55 in 1888. Some modern medical researchers feel that the long-term ill health that led to her demise may have been lupus. Beyond Louisa's life, her tale of the four adolescent March sisters has gone on to live in the consciousness of the public for nearly 150 years. It has been through numerous major publishing editions. And has inspired stage plays, films, television program, musicals, an opera, countless other Little Women inspired products, and even a Japanese anime series. But perhaps closest to the hearts of doll collectors today are the many versions of these characters that have been translated into doll form. Chief among those to realize the popularity of dolls depicting the marches and their friends was Madame Alexander. Some of her very earliest cloth dolls included the March sisters. These 16-inch dolls came out in the early 1930s. The earliest examples had pressed felt faces and mohair wigs. Later examples had cloth mask faces and yarn hair, as seen in this example. The 1933 release of the film, directed by George Cukor, further enhanced the sale of Madame's Dolls. The movie starred Katherine Hepburn as Joe, with Joan Bennett, Jean Parker, Francis D., and Douglas Montgomery. In 1935, composition Little Women were introduced using the 7-inch Tiny Betty mold. These were sold individually and in sets. Composition Little Women were also available in 9 and 13 to 15-inch sizes. The 1949 film version with June Allison as Joe, along with Elizabeth Taylor, Margaret O'Brien, Janet Lee, Peter Lawford, and Mary Astor, was tremendously popular and stimulated demand for Madame Alexander's hard plastic Little Women dolls. These were 14 inches tall. The earliest of these had strung bodies and floss hair. Their hands were small. Note the lovely looped floss curls used on an early Amy. A page from the May 1949 issue of Playthings magazine pictures floor displays of the 14-inch dolls at B. Altman and F.A.O. Schwartz. The 1949 version of the dolls' costumes are shown here. Many fabric variations can be found and make for an interesting and exciting hunt for the Alexander Collector of today.
time progressed, changes to hand size occurred. A walker mechanism was added to the body, and the wigs changed from floss to saran. From 1950 to 1952, a set of 15-inch little men was also available. These hard plastic dolls are quite desirable when found. 8-inch hard plastic little women joined the line in 1955. These smaller dolls were sometimes used to create shadow versions of the larger dolls. Little women dolls have remained popular in the Alexander line throughout the years and followed the same general trends of materials and body construction as seen on other Alexander dolls. The Lissy face was used for these dolls beginning in 1957. These had high heel feet and jointed elbows and knees. From 1959 to 1968, they had flat feet and no elbow or knee joints. The Nancy Drew face was used for this 12-inch set from the early 1980s. In 1994, a new film version of the story was released by Columbia Pictures and again stimulated sale of the dolls. The film featured Winona Ryder in the role of Joe and included Trini Alvarado, Kristen Dunst, Samantha Mathis, and Claire Danes as her sisters, with Susan Sarandon as Marmy. The FAO Schwartz Christmas catalog of that year featured this exclusive set. 1996 was the first year that Alexander's 10-inch Sasset model was used for little women. From 1997 to 2000, a 16-inch set called Little Women Journals was released. The dolls in this set had accompanying stories and numerous outfits and accessories. In 2001, a set of 5-inch tall dolls called Very Little Women could be had. These were made of porcelain and had glass eyes. In addition to the dolls created by Madame Alexander, numerous other companies would bring out their versions of these much-loved characters. Frances Deeks was born in Cohoes, New York, and studied at the New York School of Fine Arts. In the 1930s and early 40s, she was becoming well-known for the wonderful dolls she made representing stars of the stage. She would go on to continue making dolls with her husband, Bernard Ravka, whom she wed in 1947. Frances was known to have created Little Women dolls prior to her marriage. These were marked with paper hang tags as seen here. In the mid-20th century, the dolls of yesterday were being regarded with a new sense of nostalgia. Ruth Gibbs' Goaty's Ladies dolls were reminiscent of the China dolls of the previous generation or two. The Gibbs line included Little Women dolls in the late 1940s. These were available individually and in five doll sets, such as the one shown here which included the March Girls in a 7-inch size and a 9-inch Marmy. Kimport was one of the major forces driving the hobby of doll collecting in the second and third quarter of the 20th century. They not only sold antique and artist dolls to an eager and growing collector population, but they also had various series of dolls made for them by artisans working under their Kimcraft label. The 1948 Kimport catalog included a set of Kimcraft Little Women dolls. These were made of a composition-like moldable material. The largest doll in this set was nine and a half inches tall, and they are a real treat for the collector lucky enough to find them now. In the early 1950s, American doll artist Martha Thompson sculpted a beautiful set of Little Women dolls. These glass-eyed dolls were 18 inches tall, had porcelain shoulder heads, lower arms and legs on cloth bodies. Each was finely detailed with elaborate headwear and hairstyles. Thompson was a member of the National Institute of American Doll Artists, and she marked her dolls with both incised and stamped marks. 
paper doll versions of Little Women have been popular throughout the years. The Hallmark Company produced a series of paper doll cards in 1949. These cards had front and back images and verses on the inside of the card. Undoubtedly, this set was yet another product inspired by the MGM film of 1949. as was this set, published by Raphael Tuck & Sons, which even mentions the film on its box cover. Southfield Publishing of Akron, Ohio did several different sets of Little Women paper dolls during the 1950s and 60s. Throughout the remainder of the 20th century, many paper doll artists have chosen to illustrate sets of these immortal characters. Yield House of Conway, New Hampshire sold wooden furniture, household items, and decorative pieces through its catalogs and retail shops from 1947 through the 1990s. In the 1960s and 70s, their line included porcelain doll kits. These kits featured American presidents, historical figures, regional characters, and fictional characters. Much of the interest in their doll products was stimulated by the approaching American Bicentennial. All old-fashioned items came into vogue. The set of porcelain Little Women dolls they offered were nicely modeled and provided an opportunity for many a budding collector to dream of days gone by and enter into the world of doll collecting. Also riding this wave of nostalgia was Women's Day magazine. In the 1960s, they produced a number of patterns for ragdoll sets, many of which embraced nostalgic themes. Their Little Women pattern was introduced in the November 1968 issue of the magazine with a multi-page spread showing the completed dolls and accessories. The actual pattern was available as a mail-in purchase. It included the pattern for four 17-inch dolls, each of which had directions and templates for embroidered features, which gave each doll a different expression. The patterns also included multiple costumes for each doll and directions for the construction of a trunk for the doll's clothing. Ideal licensed a tie-in to the 1949 movie, creating their own version of the March Girls in 1976. Their vinyl versions of Meg, Joe, and Amy were 12 inches tall. while Beth was 8 inches tall. This followed the casting of that movie version, in which MGM had made Beth the youngest of the sisters and had her played by Margaret O'Brien. In 1977, Shackman of Chicago brought out a line of porcelain little women. These were kits to make up a 15-inch doll. The kit came with porcelain shoulder head, lower arms and legs, and a pattern and fabric for completing cloth bodies. Each doll was molded with different details underscoring their personalities. The molded hairband on Meg is especially elaborate. The 1980s boom in modern collector dolls led to the production of many versions of Little Women dolls. New companies entered the arena with dolls aimed at a collecting market 
and established companies offered their versions of these characters. Late 20th and early 21st century doll artists would continue to favor Alcott's characters. Wendy Lawton designed a 15-inch set of Little Women, which were released in 1994 by Ashton Drake as their Little Women collection. These had porcelain heads and limbs on cloth bodies. In 1995, Marmee was added to the line. Under Lawton's Connoisseur collection, Another set called Little Women Revisited was released in the early 21st century. These dolls were 14 inches tall and presented more grown-up versions of the girls than the previous Lawton Little Women designs. They featured porcelain heads on articulated wooden bodies and were produced in editions of 175 pieces of each character. In 1995, American doll artist Kathy Redmond created a wonderful set of dolls for the UFDC Region 10 Conference in Chicago. 12-inch Joe was the souvenir for this event, and her sisters were available as companion pieces. Redmond is well known for her highly detailed sculpting and the use of applied porcelain embellishments on her dolls. Redmond also created a doll to depict Louisa May Alcott herself. Felt doll artist extraordinaire Maggie Iacono released her vision of Marmee in 2017. This 15 and a half inch doll was available in a limited edition of only 40 pieces and is perfect in every detail. The characters of the March sisters brought to life the hopes and dreams of girls of the 19th century, inspiring generations of girls and women alike, and providing a rich genre for doll makers. Clearly they will remain in the hearts and consciousness of generations to come, thanks to Louisa May Alcott, who so deftly brought them to life. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the program. We would like to thank Linda Edwards for um, allowing us to use her program. Uh, Linda does many, many wonderful things for UFDC very unselfishly. Certainly, we appreciate um, her support of our project. So become a member of UFDC today. Day. Just click on the link at the bottom of the page. It will take you directly 
to our website, go to the membership page, fill out the form, and be sure to tell them Karen sent you. We'll see you next time.